Alex. <laughs> It was on the back in 2017 or 16. It was so crazy, dude. Like, yeah. Oh my bullshit. That's exactly what it is, mate. Yeah. Got first place at the land. Brought home like 250 bucks and won a keyboard because I got MVP. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's, that's how we found out. You have a little bug on your <laughs> your arm. Is it on me? Yeah, it's actually on you. What sort of drove you to come back to the Renegades after six months of absence? Um, I know that uh, you know. In the, in the meantime, I think that was when Sean and I actually joined the roster. Mm. Was that sort of something that pushed you towards? Ah, that was back in 2018. Back? Yeah, back in 2018. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, after that, I am Sydney or Brolic Dallas. What was it in 2018? I left it, I left home, and it was like it was a pretty nice time, you know, in the summer, right? Yeah. Because I had oh, the, yeah, a chance yeah. to spend like a lot of time with my family, and uh, I had this tragedy where my mom passed away suddenly in October, and then. Literally around those like same days, Jeff messaged me with a offer to come Proposal. back. They are getting you and they're getting Sean and they offered me like, if you want to come back, Aaron is going to take the IGL position and they want, they want you to come back. And I said, yeah, why not? I, at the same time, as much as I want to like be in the team again, uh, I wanted to escape the situation that I was kind of you know, just leave Serbia behind right. a little bit right. and just, you know, try to find my motivation, you know, find my drive back in, in Renegades. So it was a kind of match at that moment. I'm pretty grateful that one of the things that I'm most grateful to Renegades is that one, to be honest. Like the, they, they, they got, they invited me back then. I don't think, I don't know what happened if they didn't. Probably my life would go in a, in another direction some, somehow. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is like when 100 Thieves disbanded, right? Or they gave up CS on CS division, yeah. whatever you want to call it, right back in October or something. You obviously were left in somewhere in between, right? Looking for offers, yep. like, yep. what were you doing after? What were you like in your, what was going through your head and uh, what were you doing yourself? Obviously you were in LA back then still. Like I know the, the Australia has uh, had a lockdown in and then yep, if you yep. go in, it would be a problem. So yeah. what were your like decision making then? Like what happened? Uh, I was fucked, mate. It was darkness. It, it wasn't fun. Um, I think for, I think it was like two months or something like that. I had downtime just in LA where I was doing absolutely nothing. I think the first thing I did actually was get on top of my health again. Uh, my mental health towards the end of 100 Days wasn't the greatest. It was, it was nothing to do with them, but it was, uh, I think it was a lot of burnout in CS. It'd been a stressful year with Corona and everything on top of that and uh, really missing the family, yeah. all that sort of shit. So uh, I had to get on top of that before I did anything, but. How are you um, dealing with the fact, obviously, you'd Went to Australia for like what about a month or something before you came back to Serbia and yep. when you rejoined. Did you spend a lot of time with your family or is it like just going out sparting and like you know? A <sighs> bit of everything. A ah, bit of both. Just, okay. um, uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, you sort of miss everything, right? With Corona, you can't really do anything. And Australia is just that, you know, it's that little bubble where everything's just still normal. Yeah. There's no, no Corona over there. So it's just life as usual. But it was definitely really important for me to see my family again. It was a good. It was a good reset. I couldn't really see myself pushing that hard in CS without having that little break. But talking about, um, I guess, moving from one place to another, this is something you all guys, including me as well, we did like a transition. You know, transiting transiting from from Berlin, from Serbia to America it would be an upgrade. But for Australians, it's mostly not an upgrade going from Australia to United States, obviously. And what was the like, what's the kind of feeling? Is it what's the difference basically between moving from Australia to NA and now moving from Australia to EU? Obviously, I mean, don't count only LA, count Detroit time yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I have all my biases. Obviously, I think Australia is the best country in the world. But you know, outside of that, I think the the main difference is just you know seeing getting away from like CS, seeing your family and your friends. I think that's like the biggest difference. Other than that, it's just. You know, the grind's always the same. But if you compare like NA to EU, is it like, do you feel like more closer? Does it remind you more to home, like on home in Europe or in NA? Like, you know, in Bel let's say now you're in Belgrade, right? And you're in LA, in Detroit. I don't obviously know. above, like, don't count the language, obviously the native language is English yeah. in NA as yeah, well, yeah. but you know, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I think LA was pretty close to Australia. In, in, in some ways, in some ways it wasn't, but I definitely feel more at home in Europe, I think. In, in parts of America, it was just, 
I don't really know, you know, how to give words to it, but it's just it didn't feel yeah, it didn't feel homely. You didn't feel comfortable. What about the the CS like psychologically? How is it affecting you? Like this online bullshit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, online bullshit. That's exactly what it is, man. Yeah. It's, it's I mean we man. used to play a lot of lands. So obviously every land was you know, yeah. every important land. Ever since 2018. I mean, in 2019, we, we didn't play a single online match. Yeah, we had a 500 days of like no online game, but like, you know, now that obviously we're not really still back at the tier one CS like people we used to, and then we're just uh, not playing land events. There's no land events anyway, but yeah. how does it affect you as an individual rather than like us as a team? I think the biggest thing is it's it's sort of hard to, to draw motivation. So, mm -hmm. Like when the big lands and events are on, it's everything's sort of right in front of you, you know? Like you can sort of see the big stadiums, you can see everyone celebrating the hype around it, and it's just, you want that. Like that's, all, that's all any player wants. I remember the first time I went to a stadium, I think it was I Am Sydney 2018. Yeah. And watching the land matches there, and it's just, I, yeah, I fucking, were actually I wanted. Playing there. Yeah. yeah, you were playing there? Yeah, yeah. cool, awesome. Yeah. yeah uh, but, uh, somebody lost <coughs> only four somewhere. <laughs> well, do you miss Justin? I miss Jazzy. Yeah. Miss Juzzy Bear, yeah. I mean, he's a good bloke. I miss him for sure, 100%. Yeah, just as I miss all my teammates and all my previous. What about Chris? Do you miss Gomez? Ah, fuck no. Fuck, oh, I hate just, that guy. Yeah, it's just. Oh my God. <laughs> Chris, I, I miss this. I miss Chrissy Poo. Chris, uh, yeah. Chris made everyone's lives easier. You don't really realize like how much he really does for you until, until he's gone. gone yeah, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Dude. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess this is like a, a 2018 question, but. When did you sort of realize that we were a team and that we were gonna, you know, we were sort of gonna make it as a team? Uh, in the Katowice bootcamp. Katowice bootcamp. You remember it was like we played a lot of. Uh, actually, maybe I'm I'm wrong there. The the moment I realized we can be good and we can accomplish something, uh, it's the during the Pro League finals in Denmark. You remember True, that Odin's, one? Yeah, that's right. In Odin's, where yeah. we lost to Mouse Sports yeah. in that ridiculous game we on, on Mirage won. and something. Or we won cash, I think, 16-1. Destroyed them. And then we lost... No. I think it's like oh, yeah, we, we lost 16-14 on Mirage, and then I think we were... We lost on train after yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I remember it was Oscar like 16, having like 10 million or something. or something. Yeah. And then he did an anti-doping test and something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I thought we were on drugs. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I think after during that event, after that event, I realized that we kind of have uh, good chemistry and like good lineup and everybody True. was like kind of enjoying playing CS True. those days. Yeah. Uh, and then I think everything got even better on that long ass boot camp in Katowice in Warsaw. You remember? Yeah, we two months in, in the hotel room. We were just I playing and playing yeah. and playing and it, every day looked like the same, but it felt like for me, we were making progress every single day a little bit, you know, during boot camp. Then, you know, we had like from there, we had the, more than a few boot camps, right? And yeah. then some of them were not so productive, some of them maybe are, but that one especially was like super, like mega productive. Like every day that we did, like that we practiced, it was like a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Yeah. And then the major came and all of that 2019, you know? It all paid off. Yeah. So I think that the Olden's 2018 was the trigger, I think. True. Yeah, I'd probably say the exact same. Yeah. What did you really think was happening towards the end of like our air and hundred thieves? I think I, I think it was a lot of burnout and shit. But you know, just your point of view. Mm, I just think we were at the time. I don't think we were investing as much as we should have our time. I think we at some point maybe the online thing and the living in LA caught, caught us off guard a little bit. I think it was so, like yeah. completely strange thing to us because we are used to traveling all over and then playing every single week or every other week or. You know, yeah. we had like a full on scheduled year and all of a sudden something changed after Katowice and we we're already stuck in this whole new situation for us. You know, when you play as a normal team, as you, like you go home after tournaments and then we went back and we lived in a completely new apartment by ourselves. It was like something that we we're not used to on top of the fact that we really did not invest enough time in progress. I think you can blame a little bit everyone yeah it's like they're okay everyone has their own like kind of things that they didn't do good and obviously the burnout was uh, 
was a massive issue. I felt like people were getting too stressed. It was sort of hard to to step away from CS, you know? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't really like... I wish we had uh, a little bit of a better help dealing with those issues, you know? Because obviously all of you are young and I wasn't really... Obviously, it, the situation was completely new to all of us. It doesn't really matter how experienced you are in any of the things that you do. I feel like... It was completely new and all of the things, the little things that kind of build, build it up and it ended that way. But, you know, it was probably for for a good reason for all of us, you know, because it could have been uh, yeah, a little better. But I think it, was, it ended up all, all right for everyone, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so as well. And sort of that, that also took you to Cloud9. <laughs> what, what happened yeah. there? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think I said this like around a like billion times. <laughs> I got the same question like a billion times. Yeah, I yeah, feel yeah. like it was a completely mismatch with uh, the style of CS that we wanted to run. Uh, even between the players and the IGL and between me and IGL, it was completely different, you know. You have like five players, right, and a, and a, and a coach, right? I think maybe an IGL and two players wanted to play the one game and then the other two players and me wanted to play the other game. And yeah. it was like a little bit of a... It was a little mismatch situation, right? Yeah, and it yeah. had to end fast. It ended professionally, obviously. And we realized what's the problem that if one guy makes a compromise and the other guy also makes a compromise, I don't think we will get anywhere because we will meet halfway and we won't get anything done. Yeah. Because if I, if I want to play, if I don't want to, don't want to play your style of CS and I'm forced to, I won't be effective. Yeah. And yeah. then if I, as a coach, want to play something that you are not uh, effective at, you're not going to give me 100%. Yeah, you're both and sort of running I think you're just you're not getting anything. Yeah. So, you know, it had to end that way. It didn't end for C9, sadly, as well, like, as we saw these days. But, yeah, it was a not very good project at the end. <laughs> so, um, once I left, in when was it March? Something, Something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, what was different? Like, how bored were you when I was gone? <laughs> Just kidding. Now, what was actually different? Uh, did anything got better or worse? Or you mean 100 days? Yeah. And we got big chat? No, it's just like in general. Obviously, when, when chat was there as well, but like in general, was it like anything? Or did you have like a different vibe in the team? Was it something that the structure has changed or anything, any basics or any like kind of whatever you can think of? Practice know. wise, game wise. I saw that you guys. Change a few positions, change them back, for example, a nuke or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But other than that, like any something, be something behind the scenes. Not much really tra changed. Uh, I guess the atmosphere was a little bit different for a few days, but everyone was just so so stressed and so burnt, and you know, everyone had a million things on their mind that weren't CS towards uh, the end of Hundred Thieves, I think, and uh, yeah, it was sort of weighing on everyone and. Sometimes when there's like a, a change in the roster, everyone sort of feels this like fresh like motivation or whatever in the team, and you know there's a good mood for a little bit. But that didn't really, it didn't really last long for us. It just uh, things were still rough. They weren't good. Yeah, yeah. So when Chet came and left, obviously you got him because he was like pretty much the only choice, only valid choice you got there, yeah. unless you want to take a risk on someone, right? Yeah. So what happened like towards the end? Why did he leave or? Whatever the, I never asked you guys. Literally, like this is not just a for the show. I never really specifically asked what happened there. Why did he go, or did you guys? How did you go the other way? You know, your own way. I don't know. I, I guess it was sort of the same sort of thing as you and Cloud Nine. We had stylistic clashes. Chat sort of wanted the team to go one way, and we were sort of thinking a different way. Why is that? We we sort of felt comfortable, I guess, with uh, roles positions, everything. We sort of felt like we had found our groove and what worked for us and we felt like we sort of knew what we were doing. Yeah. Chet wanted to to mix that up, you know, like Justin was obviously our star player and he wanted to make Justin even more than that, you know, he wanted him to make him make him a superstar. So uh he'd move Justin around and it'd sort of I think at sometimes it'd also throw Justin off, you know, because yeah. he's a player that has to feel comfortable in his spots. Yeah, that's, it, that's, it's that's an important true. it's an important thing. Yeah, nothing really sort of worked out, and you know he had his mates, and a lot of his mates moved over to Valorant, and I guess he just wanted to go with them. 
Yeah, like we, actually we actually found out like in the middle of the tournament that we were playing, we saw an article release saying uh, Chet's actually leaving 100 Thieves and he's going to Valorant. So yeah, well, that, I need that's to how we found out. You have a little bug on your, <laughs> your arm. Is it on me? Yeah, it's actually on you. Fuck Under me. The, it's like right here. I'm it's not going to look, there. dude. I'm fucking oh, wig out. God. He's going to eat you. Yeah, probably. Um, what made you stick with the same lineup after the 100 Thieves? Like, you obviously had other offers and there was a chance you go back to Australia, obviously, because you couldn't stay in LA forever. Mm -hmm. So what made you stay with Aaron and Sean? I think at the end of at the end of it, I was set on going back to Australia and just taking a break. I was I was really done with CS for a while there, hey. It was a tough time for me. But I think after you know how I said I had that grace period where I, I spent about a month just getting on top of myself again, making sure that I felt good. And after that, I saw it, sort of understood that I still wanted to compete. I still wanted to do everything yeah, the best, the highest level. So uh, going back to Oz wasn't really an option, hey. But mm -hmm. I had my options, and I was very close to signing with uh, with one of my options. But I think it was probably like 15 minutes, 20 minutes before I was putting Actually, pen to paper yeah, with my contract. Oh my I was literally God. talking to the GM saying, I'm signing right now, just give me a second. And I get a message from, I think it was Sean, or it might have been Aaron, saying they have this brand new opportunity with Extremum. And I just instantly hopped on it, mate. Like, uh, I didn't want to, yeah. It would have been a different step in my career, but I, I feel like this one was just, it It makes no sense to, to pass it up. This is a team that's been top five in the world. We've done fucking incredible things together. And uh, well, I mean, we hold hold a legend spot at the major. Yes, and that's, still, also, yeah. that's also important. So. Or what, three years now? <laughs> third year now? Yeah, yeah. It's actually, it's actually crazy. Yeah. Like, those memories from the, from the majors were actually insane from zero and two. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you can talk about like uh, Berlin major. That was a... Can you describe... Obviously, I remember it, but I guess you can describe um, the feeling on zero two oh, and the walk good. back from the from the venue to the pink hotel? Uh, it was not good, mate. I think it was a walk to the burger place, actually. Burgersteig. Yeah, Burgersteig. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think uh, we were all just sort of done. No one was happy. I, th I think we had a really rough string of events before Berlin. Yeah, the whole summer. Yeah, the whole summer was rough for us. And uh, when we were zero two, I think everyone sort of had one foot out the door. Everyone was looking at different things they could be doing. Uh, yeah, zero two, walking to Burgersteig. It was just, it was darkness, mate. I think everyone was just sort of saying something to, to lighten the mood. No one, no one like, reacted, you, you, yeah. you'd say a joke and no one would laugh and then you just sort of look at your feet and then the next person would do the same thing. But uh, yeah, I, I think I made a dumb, dumb fucking statement about getting getting a tattoo yeah, if we if bounce you, back from zero two and yeah. if we actually did, so. You and know. you didn't do the tattoo. Yeah, maybe eventually. Yeah, maybe, yeah, eventually. yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, one sure. day, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that was, uh, that was, uh, Dark time, dark day, very dark day. And then it's interestingly enough, we had like a swing of uh, momentum, kind of. You can see like the darkness in zero and two, and the fact that we beat G two. You see the light coming it's just through, just like completely different, right? <laughs> and then yeah, we had a pretty good year, 2019, I can say. Yeah, yeah we ended the year pretty well, I think. Yeah, with hundred thieves. Like make a maybe people would. Try to understand like what's the difference between hundred thieves and renegades. Obviously, the renegades were the one that gave you a a real chance, right, to compete yeah, in the yeah, yeah. in the best Australian team at the time. Yeah. Like everybody in Australia wants to be wanted to be in renegades yeah. in a way, right, yeah, to get yeah, a chance to compete. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a fair thing to say. And then renegades were the one who actually gave you the chance, right? But the the biggest org right now so far that we were a part of until. The end of 2020 was uh, it was hundred thieves, you know, and uh, you know the difference between those two organizations. Obviously, it's like it's a lot more professional, right? You know, the Renegade staff. I think towards the end of when we were in it, it was four people, five people oh, yeah. working. It was struck more structured, yeah. Yeah, but in in, in hundred thieves, I, I think it was a team of a hundred people. You know, it, it, there was a person for everything, and everything just got done instantly. Yeah. There was nothing to ever worry about. Media was fantastic, professional. It's sort of hard to put it into words, but you know, when you're in a great org, that's just you don't really notice because there's nothing you have to worry about. You're just sort of there. Uh, you know what I mean? 
Now I have a question. Uh, the thing is, like, obviously you came from order mm. to Renegades. And uh, let's say you're getting maybe closer to the end of your career-ish, kind of, you know. You're still young, but let's say. <laughs> Would you mm -hmm. consider going back to uh, Oz and finishing up your career there? Like, especially because I'm mentioning order because Chris Gomez, our former manager, is now the GM there, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. As you said, like, I have this drive to compete. Yeah. And if I'm not available to do anything over here, 100%, I'll try and continue my career in Australia if, if that's what I got to do, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Order's a great org. I had a great time in that team. It's a, I remember, like, we were always, I told this, I said this, like, a bunch of times. Whenever we were, like, sitting down in, um, in Detroit, right? When El Carlo, you still was in the team, and mm. uh, I don't even know who else was there. Maybe Nifty was there, and then we were always sitting in the. Even Yod was there. We were always sitting in the lounge room, right, and watching TV. And Australian CS was always like fourteen hours like ahead or behind or whatever. Yeah, we're always watching you so play, Randy games, yeah, yeah. play order playing. I don't know who was it in Unity or I yeah, know. yeah, Greyhound, Greyhound. Yeah, Sean was there. Did you guys ever think that you're gonna end up together in Renegades, kind of? How, how did that happen? Actually, you know, that, that before we answer that, because when Renegades told me, like, called me back, they told me, like, uh, you have uh, these people, like, that are playing, and they mentioned you and, and Sean, right? How did that happen, like, that? Man, it's still a little mystery to me. When I, was, uh, when I was scouted for Renegades, I guess, I was told I'd be joining the team. I had no idea who I'd be replacing. I didn't know what was going on. I was... I was asked if I could IGL for the team. Oh my God. And I, I said, yes, absolutely. I can, I can all I can IGL entry. What, what do you want? Um, so. just, just let me in. I think uh, the story I've always said is like, when I landed, I met up with Sean in, uh, in LA, I think, like flying to Detroit together. Yeah. I didn't, like, I think I knew like the day before that Sean was coming with me. Mm -hmm. I had no idea Sean was coming with me till the end. Did you know Sean before that? I, I knew Sean, yeah. I, I'd never played in a team with him, but I, I knew of him, yeah. Like we, I think he was the one, one of the only players in Australia that like I thought was amazing but never had the chance to play with, you know. Like I, I played with a lot of people in the scene at the time. But yeah, we, we, we met up in LA and we were just like trying to work it out between us, like who we were replacing, like what's actually going on. I knew that Sean was coming with me so it was a chance that Nifty wasn't going to be in the team anymore. Yeah. They'd asked me to IGL. Nifty's not there anymore. I'm, I'm thinking maybe I'm IGLing for this team. I read a report saying that Yod was going back to, to Norway at the time. So I was thinking maybe you still is still on the team. I had no Pretty idea, mate. Time. So we, uh, when we got to Detroit Airport, we met up with Gomez and he sort of gave us a rundown. We, we thought that, or I thought that uh, Yusil was still at the house. I was going to have like an awkward greeting with him where he's sort of leaving and I'm walking in. But yeah. he, he left the night before. Yeah, he ended up in, in order and you ended up running it's kind of a slot. Yeah, yeah. But it's a completely different role. How was it moving from, from Serbia to America? Uh, scary as shit, dude. Scary? Uh, the thing is, like, back in uh, 2017, it was the 20th, maybe 6th December or something, where Pita from NIP back then, the coach, mm -hmm. he messaged me and he said like, hey, you, you want to like maybe go for the coaching job in Renegades, right? And they were like after the major, they lost in, I don't even know what major was it back that, that year. And then I know that we're looking for a new coach after the break, in winter break. And then I was like, yeah, maybe, why not? You know, and then he organized the call, right? He got us together. And I talked to one of the owners of, of Renegades and then and Jeff as well and then basically maybe one day later they told me it's like uh, are you ready to move move you know move and I was like yeah sure when expecting it to be like in a month or you know in a month and a half or something like this it needs to be a process of like whatever and yeah. I was like yeah it was need to be on the fifth it was the exact same for me man I was like excuse me yeah. Yeah, yeah it was like on the fifth yeah and obviously I didn't know what to do or why I need to like I love the the job the game whatever and it's an opportunity so I said why not it was a little bit difficult because I need to leave my family and my girlfriend back at the time I was we were living together so it wasn't the wasn't easy wasn't the prettiest night when I had to explain all of that but it's something that you have to do right I yeah. mean you understand yourself you had a girlfriend yeah, back yeah, when you left to, yeah. to Detroit so it's a it's not an easy task you know but it's a part of the journey I guess or something 
And uh, yeah, I just went get on a plane and I remember Chris uh, welcoming me <laughs> on that long ass drive from yeah, the, the Detroit to the house. Yeah, yeah, the big the big Asian guy that was always driving us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then uh, the long ass drive, he was explaining everything. I remember walking into the house for the first time and then all of like, Chris was there plus five Australians, right? Ricky was there and Carlo and uh, Aaron, Justin and... Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they all welcomed, welcomed me pretty good, right? And it was so weird, dude, because I couldn't understand like half of them a single word they were saying. Obviously, I wasn't yeah. fluent in English yeah, back yeah. then, and it was. Oh man, Australian is not easy, dude. If you're not fluent in English at all, like <laughs> you don't speak it on daily basis, and you know it's a, it can be a problem. And I hear Aaron just saying some <laughs> random things, and I'm yeah. trying to understand. Like I'm asking like for the positioning or something in game that to yeah. explain like who holds what, what, what's happening, right? Because I didn't have much time to prepare, obviously, because it was like a week and it was a New Year's and it, you need to like organize everything. So you don't get to prepare a lot. And Aaron is talking and I don't understand a single word. Yeah, yeah. And the, the wording that I kept saying, yes, and yeah, yeah, so I don't <laughs> want to look dumb, yeah, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I couldn't understand. For the first two and a, two or three months, it was a big of a problem. The, the easiest one to understand was Yam, I think. But Justin and Carlo and uh, Aaron especially... Uh, that was a that yeah. was a problem. Yeah, Aaron's a bit awkward. Yeah, bit uh, but accent. later on, like it came so easy, right? Yeah. And I even even Yod as well. We we picked up some of the yeah everyone Australian saw he's slang, saying, slang, saying yeah. like yeah CBF, you know, <laughs> and uh, other stuff. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, it was a fun times. Mm -hmm. A bit scary though, because you're leaving everything, but you know you have to do it. Yeah, so you just go all in, and you know. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. You yeah. can always come back home. It's fine, you know. Uh, and uh, but you just need to take uh, steps sometimes and just go for it, you know. Do you really feel the the difference between the American scene and the European scene? I mean, I yeah. do. But... Yeah, I think I think everyone, it's, <laughs> everyone uh, does. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like um, day, day and night. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. The thing is, like in America, everybody everything is so chaotic and random and like yeah. loose and all over the place in Europe, in tier one teams, especially it's more structured, organized. There's a difference, like when you play uh, European teams, you can actually learn playing against them. You know, you don't have to practice your own thing. You just learn by what they do. You can you can get to learn something a lot. For example, like teams like Astralis or yep. FaZe or back in the day, right? Or uh, G2 nowadays, or, you know, all these top teams, you play against them and you learn on scrims just from what they do. In America, it's a little bit more chaotic you know there, is, there wasn't the back in 2017 or 16 it was so crazy dude like right. the weird thing is like it works for them you know it's uh if you go in with this style european style in na you can have problems if you don't know how to adapt right it's true yeah and it's also the other way around right? yeah i'm not counting the cis teams they just have their game on their own right yeah now. but uh yeah the, the, the way like, that uh that i sort of saw it was i mean when you're in europe you sort of learn how to when you're practicing you learn how to play your own game and build on your own game. But yeah. when you're in America, you sort of learn how to play against your opponents. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, they sort of just run at you. Yeah, there's also a difference between the scenes, like tier two American is way weaker than tier two European. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, there is like a massive difference, you know, yeah. the tier two in Europe can compete while the tier two in NA can barely do anything. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest difference there. That's true. What about Australians? Yes, like uh, how does it? Obviously, you talk to a lot of Australian players right now. Yep. I mean, you have a lot of mates there. See how I said mates. <laughs> uh, um, what's the current situation there? How are they developing? Considering obviously Renegades couldn't fly for a year and uh, whatever, but how are they develop developing there? I mean, no, Chris is obviously in all in order, and is there any new talent? What's going on there? Yeah, I think they have a bit of new talent on that team. Vexite is a name that comes to mind. Okay. Little, little young gun. But I don't know. In, in Australia, it's, I think it's always been the same. Even when I was starting out, like when I first started CS in 2015, 2016, um, the scene was always the top four teams in Australia can sort of compete with each other. Yeah. And the best team out of that top four sort of can make a name for themselves overseas, like Vox always did. Vox were always yeah. a name overseas people recognized but and then you had greyhound and uh, yeah yeah order and like they were fighting against yeah exactly other. yeah that, that, there's always one name that sort of stands out at a time in the scene and uh 
right now it's all sort of kill the king with a uh, with greyhound or renegades yeah. now but um now the dexter is like in mouse sports it could be a little bit easier for that's them. true yeah yeah maybe some other teams can sort of step up to the plate yeah but there's no more igls in australia right yeah. there was only one yeah a true one right the only that's actually like a proper one yeah i mean gyro in order he's a he's a set igl that guy i've heard heard, heard good things about him so Maybe he's a name to look out for. Yeah, I yeah, will see. But uh, uh, what yeah. about like, let's say after you are done with CS, how old are you? Twenty three, four, whatever. Twenty three. Let's say what seven, ten years doesn't matter. Are you gonna stay in uh, esports? Like, uh, take some sort of I don't I don't see you as a coach, just because of your like character. Yeah, you're more so a you know quiet person. Yeah. yeah. But uh, would you stay in CS in terms of like a upper management or some sort of like a GM I mean you obviously have the brains for it but did you ever consider like something obviously it's too early but you know yeah it's a, it's a bit early for that it is a bit early but you you can't think about it right yeah I mean I guess the question would be did you consider are you going to stay in esports after everything is done because we all know that esports is not going anywhere that's true yeah but I think Every day gets a little bit harder. You know, you, you look at the people that are running the orgs, like the, the top dogs, the, all the big orgs right now, and their, their qualifications like unbelievable. These guys have like 18 degrees and, you know, they've yeah, been, been around the block a few times. That's a, that's an interesting question. I think the opposite. Like, you think the opposite? I think actually the opposite. I think some of the influential spots in the organizations that are being filled by not enough people with not enough qualifications. Literally. I mean, there is also... Uh, really smart and competent people. One of those would be John Robinson from mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from uh, Hundred Thieves. I think that guy is amazing. I even like whatever he says is smart. Like yeah. literally yeah. everything. Yeah, you listen to him. Like obviously he's very well educated, and you can you can listen to him every day. But there is like a lot of organizations that people are just uh, being put there for no special reasons. Maybe I can be one of them. <laughs> as long as the money is coming in, I, I don't know, mate. I, I I'd like to stay in, in esports if possible, but you know, I, I sort of realize that it's not always possible. You know, sometimes you sort of have to have to move on to something else. And, yeah, uh, but how do you put an end on it? You know, I don't it's know. Like, uh, how do you hang out the mouse? I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult. <laughs> but yeah, how did you go for actually when you're talking about this? How did you pick CS? I know you played League of Legends, so and you were pretty decent, right? Yeah, I mean. So why did you stop? Because it's a shit game. That's it, that's it. Uh, I, I, mate. I don't know. Like, I played a lot of League, and it was during a time where I should not be playing League. It was towards the end of my like school years. Yeah. And uh, it was tough for me because for you to be good in League of Legends, you have to be playing 10, 12 hours every single day. And if you stop playing 10, 12 hours every day, you lose your mechanics instantly. You suck. And you're not in the top anymore. Jesus Christ. So uh, for me to be doing schooling and be doing that at the same time, it was just impossible. It was just, you know, it was a burden on me. At some point, I just stopped enjoying it for that reason. So about the school part, I know Justin was always, he kind of cut his university, you know, he kind of stopped it just to go on uh, on his mission mm. in CS. Did you do the same? Yeah, yeah. I you know, I'd made it into university. I was deferring from university. I was planning on university still. But the moment that I saw that, you know, CS was this actual thing that was developing and I got, I think I got offered one of the first salaries for like an Australian player. You know, I think it was something like $200 a week. You know, it wasn't, yeah. you're not living on that, but it was awesome for the time. I was thinking I was making bank, mate. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's nice when you see like money coming in. Yeah, yeah, for the, the first time. Yeah, crazy, yeah. Right? But, um, yeah, I had something else in mind. Uh, oof, I can't remember. What about right? you? <sighs> like, when, when did you sort of realize that CS was, you know, what you sort of... I didn't realize actually CS was a thing. I realized video games are a thing. I knew it instantly when I was like a 14-year-old kid, you know, back in 2020. In 2000, sorry. Mm. Uh, at the beginning of a new millennium, right? And... Uh, I used to play at my neighbor's PC because we didn't have money for, for yeah. our own, right? Yeah, right. So there's always like this neighbor that has like, <laughs> you know, the PCs, the, yeah. the, the consoles, the everything. Yeah. So I used to hang around with him. And uh, I know his mom didn't like me because we spent too much time playing video games. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I copped that a few the, times. Yeah. The thing is, like, uh, I realized then that 
there's gonna there's something in this one, right? The way you realize when you play CS, right? You can see that that game has something in it, right? You don't know what it is. It has something in it, right? It's true. like uh, it, there is something that true, drives you true, to true, just true. play, 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 right? Though that that's what I realized back in 2000 that there's something with video games. You know, it was fun, and I think it was going somewhere. And, in 2000. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the CS just started, I didn't play CS from the I think maybe from the very beginning, but maybe a little bit like 1.3 version or something like that. I used to play Resident Evil Nemesis. That's what, that's the first game. You know, Don't just, think I've ever played that. Just, just a long, <laughs> long time ago. But anyway, yeah. Good for you. you can see that, that the video games are going to be something crazy, right? It turned out to be true. You know, we are all living the dream pretty much right now. You're right. And uh, there's a lot of stress, obviously, and we are experiencing some of it these days. But uh, there is a lot of uh, nice things that can change your life. I think CS changed all of our lives. 100%, yeah. Uh, we don't know where we would be like if, if, it, if it wasn't like for CS, you know, and yeah. all the people that are supporting it and all the orgs that are involved and all the sponsors and everything else that can actually provide us with all of the nice things that we can, you know, get for ourselves. So you don't know. Like I think, like I said, I think for everyone, CS changed their lives like totally. And obviously, the the thing is like it kind of. I think you can you can relate to that as well. It kind of costs you some relationships, not romantic, just in general, like with friends, oh, yeah, maybe yeah, with, yeah. Uh, some of the family members. But you know, yeah, that's the thing that I wanted to ask you the the fact like uh, the family angle. You know, I always tell the story how supportive Nico's family is, like for him. You know, mm -hmm. because I I'm, I was. I was growing up like as he did at the same time, kind of, and uh, I was witnessing all of that, you know, and uh, uh, he got tremendous uh, support from his <clears throat> mother and father, you know, and uh, Hunter as well, you know. So I was like, I guess the question would be, how did it go for you? Did you get a lot of criticism? Because some of the players get a lot of criticism because the, the generation before us, like our parents are oh, obviously yeah. not in the digital age at all. Yeah, yeah. They were like all about the other. The priorities are different, but we are okay. We are like living on a <laughs> on another on another planet, kind of right. Yeah. And how was the support for you from the parents and the family in general? Um, there were different stages. I mean, when I was a young kid, like eight, nine, I remember getting banned many times from playing games because I'd get violent and angry and I'd yell and abuse people all the time. My parents did not like that. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think from day one, my parents always sort of just had my best interests in mind, like over anything else. And, you know, the, I think they were right 100% um, in that they didn't really want me to, to spend as much time playing games growing up. Um, you know, I, I get kicked off the PC at 10 p.m. every night. <laughs> yeah. No later than that or I'm in trouble. But I guess it sort of started changing in maybe 2015. I think I went to, I told my parents I was going like, out with my mates or going to see a movie or something like that, when really I was going to a LAN. I went to the LAN, got first place at the LAN, brought home like 250 bucks and won a keyboard because I got MVP. That's when they sort of realized like there's right, maybe there's something to this, you know, maybe he's not just, you know, wasting his time on the computer. Yeah, playing video games. Yeah, then, yeah. and ever, ever since they sort of realized that there was something to it, they, they had a look at it themselves and... You know, they saw yeah. esports was growing and it was a real thing. And you know, these days, like my mom, my mom's my my, my rock, yeah. my number one supporter, sort of thing. So, yeah, they're, they're they're fully on board these days. So I noticed in Australia, right, talking to pretty much all of the Aussie guys, right, that the most important thing for you guys is like to earn enough money. I mean, in that sense, don't mm. get me wrong, because you're making a face. Yeah. Uh, earn enough money to buy themselves a house, right? Who's? Yeah. And then, uh, so they don't have to worry about mortgage and like, that's like a number one thing I noticed yeah, with like a lot one. of Aussie people. Like it's not like a random person that's yeah. just one out of whatever. That's, it's true for me as well. Is it? Is, yeah, it, like, is it that important? Uh, I mean, it's it's something you can always have, you know, it's it's an investment. It sort of sets you for life. Like once you bought a house, like you, I think you're sort of set. Especially in Australia, house prices are so expensive over there, mate. So, you know, it's a uh, it's a priority, I guess. I mean, it's not really a priority. It's just sort of something. It's a goal. Yeah. It's your it's your first like financial goal, yeah. I guess, as a as a young man, young Australian. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. 
Is, is it not the same in Serbia? No, like, do you look I at mean, it differently? I, I guess, I think so. <laughs> For me, I never actually thought that way. Maybe because, I mean, I I don't want to like sound like I'm bragging, but mm. I got, my family left me a kind of house, you know, and just, I got like, you know, I have it. Yeah. But I think it's a, uh, it's not a priority number one, like the same in Australia, because I don't, I don't think people look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a priority, just a, just a goal, just something to sort of have, you know. The way I figured it out, it's like a priority for Australians, but okay. maybe it's just Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing with you guys. My chair's all wet for the next man. Nice sweaty ass. Do you have NZ?